who have joined JD and yet not started their classes. We welcome you all. I know we've had some two really interesting sessions about uh, computational design, the post-pandemic luxury retail sector, and also about fabrication in the last two days, uh, where the industry insight has been quite uh, quite helpful for students to understand how we're expecting to transition to this new normal. And uh, today we have classes. someone very very special we and very very important I know with us. Had uh, I think she's someone questions. that everyone knows about. Her work has spoken for herself. Uh, time and again and uh, before we get into the session with Ms. Sunita Kohli, I would just like to give a little introduction about Sunita ji. Uh, so yes, I and we request all the students that as in when you have any questions, please keep on adding them to the question and answer chat box. Uh, someone from the team would be notifying you while the chat box is open. Uh, so yes, let's get started with our session for today. Uh, Ms. Sunita Kohli is the president of K2 India which is an award-winning firm of architects and designers, whose co-founder and CEO is architect Kohalika Kohli. In 1992, Sunita Kohli was conferred the Padma Shri for contribution to national life in the field of interior design and architectural significant public and heritage buildings, hotels, cruise boats, ports, palaces, libraries, museums, corporate offices, and select residences in India, Bhutan, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, and Egypt. In New Delhi, Ms. Sunita Kohli has restored, furnished, and decorated many British period buildings designed by Lachins, Baker, and Robert Tor Russell, notably Rashtrapati Bhavan, the Prime Minister's office, and the Secretariat which is still unchanged through the tenure of nine prime ministers, the Hyderabad House, the official residence of the prime minister, and the bungalows of Indira Gandhi Memorial Museum. In 1990, she interior designed the British Council Building, the largest of that 80 institutions worldwide, and has done the interior architecture and design of DLF corporate office on Parliament Street in New Delhi. In 1989, Ms. Sunita Kohli designed the National Assembly Building in Thimpu, Bhutan. Again, in April 2010, for the SARC summit held in Thimpu, she and Kohilika Kohli worked on these parliament buildings. Sunita Kohli is a former chairperson of School of Planning and Architecture in Bhopal. She has lectured and presented papers at several prestigious institutions and universities in the UK, the US, and Southeast Asia, such as Howard University, at Emory University, and University of Edinburgh. She is fellow of the Hale Institute of Global Learning at Emory University in Atlanta. She has presented several papers on design, architecture, historical conservation, literature, Mughal jewelry as a statement of empire, world heritage cultural sites in India, and on social entrepreneurship. Ms. Sunita Kohli is a founder trustee of Satya Gyan, an NGO that works on women literacy. She is the chairperson of the Governing Council of Save a Mother. In 2005, Ms. Sunita Kohli founded the Museum of Women in the Arts India for the millennial book on New Delhi published by Oxford University Press. Ms. Sunita Kohli wrote an extended essay on the planning of New Delhi and Sir Edwin Lachins. She is considered an Indian expert on Lachins' work in New Delhi. Presently, four books are under preparation and publication. Recently, she co-authored the Lucknow Cookbook with her mother, Chan Su. About this book, S. Prasnanjan, the editor of Open Magazine, wrote, this is a cookbook as a cultural testament by one of India's most accomplished aesthetes. Every recipe in this book tells a story that is more than culinary. It takes us to the private kitchen of our heritage, lest we forget the range and richness of the taste of the subcontinent. Marinated in ancestral memories, the Lucknow cookbook draws its ingredients from cultural history of a different time. Never before has tradition been presented more tastefully, close quotes. The Lucknow cookbook has been launched in almost every premier literary festival in India and is in its fifth run. So with that, I would actually like to welcome uh, Sunita Ji to you uh, for our webinar with JD Institute of Fashion Technology. And uh, I know you've had a tremendous journey and I think it's, 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 it's fabulous that you are here to talk to our students about the work and the type of different projects that you have, you know, uh, 
done throughout your uh, career so uh, could you could you please tell us a little bit about of these projects and your company k2 india and the kind of projects that you currently undertake uh i've had a long career as you rightly mentioned you know one that is next year going to be almost 50 years so um there are several i've had the good fortune of of uh, working on several different types of projects <clears throat> and not excuse me and not necessarily that they were all large projects i mean i have i always pay as much attention to the smallest project that i might be doing of course you know i'm known for my large projects so <clears throat> like this in egypt which um up to like you Uh, in egypt one has done several hotels mainly for the oberoi group and uh, this is the mina house oberoi mm -hmm. and of course this carried its own research its own styling which is really islamic and mamluk and uh, uh then there are other projects like i've designed this hotel boat on the nile which was won every single award out of 200 boats and i particularly showed you this image because in my time you know we we drew them by pen and mm -hmm. all your students of course work with uh, you know autocad and things but we did everything that was hand drawn and uh, uh, this is uh, it it set a new norm this boat which i had done uh, designed with the swedish marine company Mm -hmm. and uh, this is the parliament building that i did in bhutan and uh, which was then again worked on in uh, 2000 and uh, uh, worked on in 2000 and uh, 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 10 for the sark summit mm -hmm. uh, i just go back to uh, uh, so this uh, the interiors that i had then done the interior architecture still remained uh, to today but what changed was that all the furniture which was basically mid century that i brought in mm -hmm. and uh uh please i'll do it uh, uh this is nyla fort and uh, uh which is a whole fort in rajasthan which i had uh, restored mm -hmm. for uh mr prs obroy the chairman of the company mm -hmm. uh this fort and then this is hyderabad house uh which is edwardian and the reason why i'm showing this is that this was all a patch of dirt mm -hmm. and so what i did when the restoration of it it was closed for a year and what i did in the restoration of it is that i i studied the laying of flag stones that lachins had used mm -hmm. uh, and then laid it out from his point of view because mm -hmm. i truly believe that when you're designing a hotel uh, you then are designing and then you want to be known for your originality and creativity but when you are restoring you hope that in 2 years time nobody will even know that there was the intervention of an architect uh, mm -hmm. and a designer and i think these are the two major differences between design and between uh, restoration or conservation mm -hmm. uh, this is rashtrapati bhavan for which i did uh, several rooms several several rooms over 5 years mm -hmm. and in this i had made it a point to use only handmade textiles that were woven all over uh, from india Mm -hmm. and also whatever artifacts that we used were made by master craftsmen mm -hmm. who had won the president's award so because you know this is the highest uh, residence in the country so i wanted to make that statement and uh uh this uh this is uh, uh this is uh south block and in this there are three uh three uh, major uh, offices one is the pmo mm -hmm. and i had completely redone uh this building uh, over 5 years of course mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And when we speak about conservation, it also means that all the massive six foot pipes that run underneath this building, which had not been attended to for 45 years, I looked at them and they carry all the services through them. And uh, I'm uh, because the PMO was designed for the prime minister and not for a particular individual, mm -hmm. I'm happy to notice, of course, they can change at any time, mm -hmm. uh, that through nine prime ministers, what I had done in the PM secretariat still mm -hmm. remains the same. And I think mm, this is what design should be. It should be timeless. It's not that, you know, you keep changing it again and again. The next one is... Uh, the uh, the British Council building of which you saw the facade mm -hmm. and I had interior designed this and uh, this is again as I said I've done very large uh, projects this was a large one the largest of the 80 buildings mm -hmm. uh, in the world and I've also done very small 1500 square feet uh, flats or apartments and with the same amount of pleasure. I think that's absolutely wonderful, the amount of experience uh, that you hold and also the memories that you would have created designing each of these buildings and to see that even after nine prime ministers, having your design, having your work still being there, I think it's, it's such a proud moment for everyone. Thank you. So uh, how did you manage to continue? You know, you've had such an inspiring career despite you were, uh, you were you're a self-taught designer who had the honor of being conferred with the first Padma Shri in the field of interior design in 1992. How have you had such an inspiring career and what would you like to say more about that? Firstly, I have to tell you, it was a completely unplanned career. When I was growing up, there was no, uh, there was no profession known as interior design. Mm -hmm. So all your students at the JD Institute are very fortunate because it's a very structured course and they must do it. Um, but, uh, you know, in my time, either you studied to be a doctor, a lawyer, or you, uh, or you went into the, uh, into the administrative services, or you became a professor. Mm -hmm. So I, of course, began life as teaching in world history, but mm -hmm. I studied English literature, both for my ma BA, my master's, I have an incomplete PhD on Christopher Marlowe, and but I always feel I could never have been a designer had I not had this wide range of having studied the humanities. So I come from, I'm an autodidact, means I'm self-taught, but um, I'm self-taught and I just grew into this, uh, this profession, so to speak. Uh, because from the first time that I started uh, started manufacturing furniture and I had a great interest in furniture because fur the history of English furniture mm -hmm. closely follows the history of English literature mm -hmm. and I happened to study the restoration of furniture mm -hmm. so uh, that little realizing that that one day would uh, would become a sort of a profession and so I started and then I got my first small place to do. And then I got my first hotel to do in 1975, where I, which was an Oberoi hotel in Khajuraho. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, can, that was like learning on the shop floor. And one as a designer is only as good as one's last project. Obviously I must have done something right that, that uh, Mr. Oberoi then gave me uh, hotels to do in Egypt and mm -hmm. some of which we saw and some which we'll come back to again later. So this began this unplanned profession and uh, so in 1992 when I was uh, it was announced that I was going to be conferred the Padma Shri there was a lot of media interest then because uh, you know the people who get the Padma Shri are either people in rocket science or their doctors or of course several architects had also got it um, and or either they're in cancer research but I so there was a lot and they all said but where did you study there was no JD Institute of Fashion Technology then let me tell you <laughs> there were no schools of interior design so unless one went abroad mm. So I said I'm self-taught, but I'm very research-based. And what 
my working on a PhD on literature taught me is how to research. And also, uh, lest your students say we can also do it on our own, I would not advise it. Therefore, my daughter also studied architecture at the Pratt Institute of Design in, uh, in New York. And also, you have to be very self-driven. Firstly, of course, you have to recognize the fact that, that this is something which is within you. And you have to have a passionate involvement in design, a passionate involvement in increasing your, uh, adding to your visual education all the time, constantly. And that happens with knowledge and that happens with travel. I think, I think that's such a, such a nicely put thing together to say that, you know, no matter what you learn, it will eventually drive you to what you want to do. So even, you know, with having varied verticals in terms of your education, you ended up doing something so great and all your education helped you through it. So, yes. that was wonderful. So, you know, we, we also know that uh, you, were the, you, are, you were the chairperson of school planning and architecture in Bhopal. Uh, what do you think were your significant contributions for the betterment of that National Institute of Excellence? See, every chairperson who comes uh, does the best that they can. Mm -hmm. I was a deeply involved chairperson. I mean, uh, through the over two years that I was chairperson, mm -hmm. I uh, was there almost every four or five weeks. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are three significant things I think that I did. Firstly, of course, I told them that we are all equal. I'm on par, whether it's the PN or mm -hmm. it's the director. So I encourage them to call me uh, Sunita or Mrs. Kohli, but not this ma'am, yes ma'am, no ma'am, you know. Um, so I encourage them to do that. And secondly, uh, there are three things, as I said, I did. One is I worked on workshops towards the history of a writing of architecture from an indigenous perspective. And we had the most, some of the most brilliant minds from across India who were part of this workshop, who came and then all their notings were done and it was all supposed to have been a collaborative effort into a book. So we, I brought out a small book, of course, a professional book because it has its ISBN number mm -hmm. and everything. And... Um, uh, so this is the book that came out okay. and I did the initial um, um, essay mm -hmm. and then uh, this is and then secondly I championed a site called Ashapuri which is 7th century with 27 fallen temples mm -hmm. and our conservation architects uh, <clears throat> I mean our students they have documented every single historical stone over there. It's a huge undertaking mm -hmm. done under the, <clears throat> under the head of that department, uh, <clears throat> Dr. Kavaitkar, who's absolutely a brilliant teacher. Mm -hmm. So uh, these are all strewn things from which are in the site museum, which is very close to Bhambetka. So in Bhopal, the students have the great advantage of being very close to three world heritage sites. Mm -hmm. Betka being one, which as all of you know, has 30,000 year old rock paintings and which are, it's absolutely stunning. And uh, then there are, uh, then there are, uh, uh, which you can see some of these rock paintings. And then it was, uh, Sorry, I'm just reversing it a little bit. Um, and then, um, and then we, uh, there was this, uh, the first time that the Southeast uh, Asian Conference of Vernacular Architects was held. And this had, uh, this had uh, 400 delegates of which 190 were vernacular architects. It was hugely successful. We presented a white paper. I mean, there was a lot of academic work that went into it and we gave it to the government. Now what's happening with it, I have absolutely no idea because as you know, in our institutions, this whole sense of continuity somehow is something we have to learn. You know, where you leave off, the next person should take 
mm. on and then from the next to the next to the next. Somehow it doesn't happen. So I really don't know. Then it, I think it looks like an amazing project and an amazing project to be part of as a student because you get to learn so many things. Yes. And you also understand how to appreciate what the Indian heritage holds for us. And for the students to get right into it with someone like you, I think it would have been a fabulous experience for everyone. Uh, no, it was even more fabulous for me. <laughs> I, no, no, I mean that in sincer with sincerity. I learned so much that it was unbelievable. And of course, as a woman, since you are director of an institute, mm -hmm. uh, I have to say that as the first woman ever appointed to head a national institute of excellence, which gives degrees. So mm -hmm. that's a first for a woman. So, um, you know, that makes me happy for, because of us. <laughs> <laughs> it makes everyone so happy. Uh, you know, you've, you've always laid great emphasis and importance in the incorporation of traditional Indian elements in contemporary Indian design projects. Mm -hmm. And as a research-based architectural and interior design firm, what is your approach when commissioned to design hotels in different locations or when you're designing or restoring the public buildings of significance? So how do you really achieve that? What is your process like? You know, this, I show you one of my very early hotels. This is the Oberoi Hotel, now called the Trident in Bhuvaneshwar. Mm -hmm. And as you see, a lot of uh, stonework has been used here, but not mm -hmm. copied exactly from what is, say, at the Lingaraja, temple or the great other great temples, Raja Rani, Mukteshwar, etc. Mm -hmm. But coming out of that tradition. So this is and whether it was using the whether it was using the uh, sorry I, I'm afraid it's going a bit back and forth. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, whether it was using the the you know the bells that have been created out of uh, bronze which is very much a technique they have a huge bronze making technique over there and um, uh, then uh, the next slide which you saw flashes off only mm -hmm. was uh, I think something's going wrong with the slides so I think the back end team would be working on that uh, yeah. So the next slide, which you saw flash off, is the parliament building that I had worked on in Bhutan. Uh -huh. In fact, it was the most difficult project that I ever researched because mm -hmm. about 88, 89, 90, there was absolutely no, uh, there were no, uh, uh, there was no uh, reference material that was available to the extent that once I heard that at the British Museum, or it, whether it was at the British Museum or the Hayward Gallery, I think. There was a major exhibition on Buddhism. So I went charging for the weekend to London and they had covered Buddhism in every single country, but Bhutan was not part of it. Uh -huh. Today, the whole story is very different and Bhutan is very well um, uh, known on the tourist map. Mm -hmm. And then I think the other slides, once they come on, I show slides of, so I work with different cultures uh, it's very important for me, to, for it, all my public buildings that they're part of a cultural milieu and mm -hmm. that, they, uh, uh, that they, it, uh, the design immediately establishes the culture of that specific place. Because, you know, this is not somebody's home. These are public buildings and they're very representative. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to remember what were the other slides that were uh, a part of this uh, question. And then, you know, whether I've worked in, in, uh, in, in Egypt, say, if I've done work in, in Cairo, which is, as I said, Islamic, uh -huh. I've done work in El Arish, which is on the Mediterranean, mm -hmm. on the north coast of the Sinai Peninsula, where mm -hmm. it's called sand and where it is, uh, you know, there I, um, I've worked with what are the available craft traditions there. One of the major things that they do over there is that since the 8th century, they've been making what they call baladi glass, okay. which is a glass that is blown. Mm -hmm. so I created these in, uh, I had particularly made it a point to show perspective uh, because it's, uh, we used to do one point or two point perspectives mm -hmm. and everything is done on the computer. But with us, everything had to be hand drawn. 
So uh, therein lies the big generational difference. Mm -hmm. So I had these palm trees that were made and all the fronds of the palm were all mm -hmm. done in Valadi glass. And it was something that had been for the first time attempted in Egypt. Mm -hmm. And uh, as they say, as they said, it required an Indian designer to come and tell us how to use our own craft traditions. Mm -hmm. But you know, that's the joy of it because it's a joy of discovery. It's a joy of, of working with new and new materials. And I love working with master craftsmen. So whatever the next slides are, we'll carry on showing uh, different, uh, uh, this is, uh, we've come back to the parliament building in, uh, in Bhutan. As you can see, it is totally uh, Buddhist and it is uh, Bhutanese Buddhist because which is different to say the one in uh, Tibetan uh, Buddhism. Mm -hmm. Maybe we can carry on with the next question. So, uh, so you know, from classical furniture to mid-century modern to classic contemporary furniture, Furniture has, you know, evolved considerably in terms of functionality and its technical inputs that, you know, we use these days. Hmm. The aesthetics of it is given over and over again. Hmm. You've been a furniture manufacturer and an excellent repute for almost half a century in that domain as well. The co-founder of K2 India, your architect daughter Kohilika Kohli also studied carpentry along with the architecture when she was back in New York studying at Pratt School of Design. Yes. So, if you could tell us a little bit more about the history of furniture manufacturing for your company and also if you uh, in some ways could share about contemporary and mid-century modern, modern furniture uh, that has become value additions to the contemporary interior spaces that we see today. Uh, well, you know, when I started manufacturing furniture, which was in 1971, I hope the slides will come on so you'll have a visual mm -hmm. A vis it can be a visual presentation uh, because you know uh, an image is worth a thousand words so what I, say, I can only describe but when you actually see the image you will get to it uh, so uh, uh, I started making uh, period furniture but English classical period furniture so it wasn't heavily carved etc so uh, the slides that we can even come back to the slides at the end uh, so I started with that and I was known for the excellence of that and for the fine proportioning of it. Mm -hmm. Of course, you know, when you are reproducing furniture, then you're not designing furniture because you cannot design period furniture. I mean, I sometimes hear this being said. You can only hope to reproduce it well. So I would get all my uh, originals from either from embassy friends mm -hmm. or I would be, be a constantly be going to England and to country sales. And if I bought a Sheraton chair there or a Heppel white chair, I would go to my hotel room and literally break it into its parts mm -hmm. so that it could fit into my suitcase and bring it back. So there's a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of adventure in, in having made it the way I did. And then, of course, um, you know, and I've done several periods, styles of furniture. I mean, I've done period furniture. I have done, uh, I then I went on to doing colonial furniture. Then I went on to doing uh, Biedermeyer furniture. Then I went on to doing um, uh, art deco furniture and then mid-century. Mid-century to modern uh, classic furniture. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, this is, you know, it takes 50 years for a furniture style to change. Mm -hmm. um, and it's very, very popular. I think we've started, we'll just do a quick run through of, uh, this is the period furniture. And today uh, you will see a lot of, uh, in my studios and in my workshops, what we produce. Can we just start moving this please? Uh, uh, we see, a this is period furniture, what you're seeing on your screens. And this is what I began with. And uh, I'm happy to say that I was noted for the kind of the quality I produced and for the very fine proportions that I produced. So mm -hmm. just do a quick run through, please. And uh, today we are doing, uh, doing mid-century furniture. And uh, when we come to mid-century furniture, I think with the image, it would be better to explain it then. Mm -hmm. And uh, as you see, these are all 18th, 19th century styles. 
but they're not and this is uh, just go back to that that is this is a designer called C Lazarus and he was mm -hmm. an Armenian and after the war he came and settled or because he was persecuted he was an Armenian Jew so he started mm -hmm. a very um, a very well known atelier of furniture in Calcutta called C Lazarus so almost mm -hmm. all the palaces of that period have C Lazarus furniture these are i i have a whole set myself which i had bought from one of these great homes and uh, because i would be buying original furniture because from lucknow to calcutta also it's part of the great talukdari belt so these okay. people lived well there were all these great homes and they would always have the finest of things and then we go into colonial furniture and uh, more colonial furniture and this is campaign furniture which also became very popular and which i do a lot of and campaign furniture literally means uh, you know which you took on campaign so uh, say a chest of drawers like this would be divided into half half on one side of the mule and half on the other side of the mule for balance uh, okay. uh, this is uh, this is furniture that is in hyderabad house which i reproduced uh whilst i was uh, working on on the conservation of that building and this is by a very famous company called wearing in gillo and i have to say that when i reproduce you cannot make out what is the original and what is the new of course i can but a lot of my clients always say really we just can't make out but they are being kind uh then uh can you come on and this is a lot of the sort of the lachin styled furniture ab aage chalte ja uh and then this is bidamaya this is bidamaya secretaires and uh, bidamaya uh, these are vitrines and a bidamaya semanie mm -hmm. and uh, uh this is also more bidamaya furniture and uh, again more and then we come to art deco art deco is a style also that stayed for a long long time in india and is still popular actually abroad because you know uh it's very boring i mean maybe your students i'm sure they know it you know today's young people are so intelligent and so clever but that is very boring to do a thematic room i mean you must have differences and focal points of interest i mean that is what will define one designer from another it's how you put things together and how you make them blend because for instance with furniture like this which is art deco you can have something which is so traditionally indian on the walls on your tables and it still works beautifully next so this is a very famous uh, desk which i reproduce uh, here i'm very proud of what the way i reproduce it because it's a paul ruleman desk which was made in 1918 and uh, it's art deco and i send these to new york and uh, somehow they all thrill with it this is also a ruleman uh, sideboard and the way i've used it for instance next and the way i've used it in uh, which is in bhutan as you can see the ceiling the walls they all traditionally painted but the furniture is all mid century it's a combination of mid century and art deco and then this is the way i've used it here and yet against the traditionally painted walls mm. in this vvip lounge it all looks beautiful in fact the the bhutanese prime minister and his majesty and all that they were very thrilled with what i had done because you know i brought in a breath of fresh air into only using you know bhutanese furniture in bhutanese homes and certainly they don't have a building as large as this as yet uh, as they said that it it is uh, as his earlier king with whom i had worked his majesty k4 as they call him he said that this will be very multi purpose this parliament building and and it will and we want it to be representative of our country for a long long time so that was what i tried to do next this is again art deco you see the furniture that i've made and then you see it uh what i've used in a house that i that actually kohelika designed in jorbag okay. 
Uh, now we come to mid-century furniture. This, these are many. Uh, just keep changing. Uh, these are very fine uh, examples of mid-century furniture that we make. And this, if uh, this is really inspired, it's called the Relaxo chairs, designed in the mid-century style by Kohelika, but it is inspired by the Napoleonic chairs that uh, Lachins had designed. And they were never in Rashtrapati Bhavan, but you find them in, in many of his manor houses. So the whole thing about this is since this webinar is mostly for students, uh, I guess, or exclusively for students, is that one has to know one's histories very well. And there is no shortcut to the study of history or to acquiring knowledge. Otherwise, you know, there's a vacuum. Otherwise, you know, you can be uh, a, a decorator with swatches of fabrics running around. But if you really want to have a deep and meaningful career, uh, that is what comes. I mean, this could never have come out of anywhere else had one not studied uh, uh, the furniture of Sir Edwin Lachins, mm -hmm. who in fact also... Uh, was revolutionary in what he did with furniture design. I mean, not just as an architect. And incidentally, here I have to tell you is that uh, several well-known uh, architects never studied architecture. Lachit is one of them. He never even went to school, but yet as his contemporaries say, he say they say that he knew some of the integral truths about our profession, which we could never learn in architectural school. Mm -hmm. So this this is uh, this is you know some uh, this is mid-century furniture which was displayed uh, in the ID, and this is a very famous uh, chair, the Corona chair, which I've used several times. Now these are processes that can uh, that came about because of the Industrial Revolution of the 19th century and all the technological advancements that were made in the 20th century. I don't make this. We always import this. I mean, the chair was made in the 1940s. Um, and as you see, it's also been used in a home here. And this chair we'll pause at because this is a chair that Marcel Brewer, who's one of the great uh, furniture manufacturers that the 20th century has ever seen, he created this uh, chair mm -hmm. and uh, it was revolutionary with what this chair did. And, you know, styles uh, from great masters also devolved down. And so this is a chair you will see in small towns like Muzaffar Nagar or Coimbatore or several other places. You will see them, you know, a lot of babus using these chairs. But where did the origin of that design come from? It's a Marcel Brewer chair. I mean, so this is, this only superb and original design can do. Next. So this is, a, this is a very famous Poltrana Frau chair called the Regina. And this combines class, classicism and uh, a modern, and a, it's a take on a classical berger, but it's a modern chair and it's a mid-century chair. It's one of the great examples of a great classic mid-century chair. Um, and this is the swan chair. You see it as it is. Again, it was designed by Arne Jacobson and who designed several very beautiful things in mid-century furniture. And, um, this is the swan chair, again, an iconic mid-century chair. But these are not chairs that I make. Uh, these are chairs that we buy, mainly from a company called Vitra, which, mm -hmm. is been, uh, uh, which has the license to produce these great classic chairs. Of course, you know, like uh, there are, what should I say, there are, there are spin-offs on all these. I mean, the Chinese are producing them without a license. Mm -hmm. They're being produced in Spain without a license. But, uh, you know, since we, uh, we, are, we will only 
we will only uh, use uh, things that are properly licensed when we uh, when clients get them. So we never suggest all these cheap ripoffs from China and all that. Next. Okay, so now this is again, uh, it's sort of a mixture of mid-century, mm -hmm. uh, classic contemporary, but the or, or origin of both these is really Biedermeyer. So in the secretaire there, designed by Kohelika, it's taken from a Biedermeyer secretaire, and on the right-hand side of your screen, it's a Simanie, but again, inspired from a Biedermeyer Simanie, which I had shown earlier. Mm -hmm. Then, uh, this is these are all examples of mid-century furniture and and several more examples that you see over here and uh, uh, here too you see uh, that you know there is a, there is something classical yet it is being uh, being uh, like the coffee table yet it is being looked at from a very uh, from a very uh, mid-century uh, point of view as far as that furniture is concerned. I think this part of it is over. So uh, back to you, Akshara. I think that was such an interesting presentation because uh, it, it also shows uh, such variety of work that you, know, you have done and incorporated in the spaces that you've designed. Uh, is my voice audible? Yes, it is. Yes, okay. it is. Uh, so I, I think it was it was it was quite educational enough for me as well. I don't come from an interior background, but I think it was amazing to see these different designs coming along. Uh, so you know, in the past two years, we've been invited to several literary festivals in India, and some of them abroad as well. So what has this aspect of your life journey been? If you could share some uh, something about them. Uh, <clears throat> you know, I think that you can never be pigeonholed into one. Uh, thing just because you're a designer it doesn't mean you just stay with design mm -hmm. all of us have different uh, um, interests different aspects to our lives my mother's a great cook who she's already a well-known cookbook author and then I in the midst of working on a book that I am on heritage in India and another book on design uh, I was very keen that my mother's cookbook uh, the next one should come out mm -hmm. so uh, my very well-known um, publishers, Alif, <clears throat> they were only willing to produce this book if I co-authored it. Mm -hmm. and also, uh, if I wrote a 10,000 word introduction. But I must say it really, um, it added another dimension to my life. And as I tell uh, David Devedar, who's uh, heads Alif, I said, you know, from a full-time designer you made me into a part-time writer so he said we are going to get a book from you one a year so mm -hmm. I you know and writing is not I thought it was very English and writing is very easy mm -hmm. but when you come down to writing that is going to be published you it's another technique altogether and of course this book was written by hand and not on the computer so that's another thing wow uh, this is a book that I have uh, recently, it's been published, of which I'm the editor. And uh, this was, uh, came after I had worked on the first uh, design festival that the Times of India group has ever held. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> all the contributors are great friends of mine. All of them are great authorities. And so the book was going to have had its launch in uh, London in April. Mm -hmm. At Milan in April at the Salone Mobile. But mm -hmm. of course, you know, we are in the age of COVID. Yeah. So that didn't happen. And then it's going to be launched throughout India. Okay. So that will happen later whenever it happens, you know. So back to you. That, that's amazing. I think, uh, you know, when we were also discussing and how you said that uh, design is not a particular thing that you do. It, it, it is not necessarily interior designing or architecture or fashion, but how design is unanimous in nature and how even literature could be part of design. So I think that is something that uh, every student should understand. And we have been trying to educate them more and more about how design is everywhere. Yes. They should not uh, restrict themselves to one particular arena uh, uh, for that fact. Exactly. Uh, 
We also have a couple of questions from our students, so I'll just read them out to you. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, the name, it's anonymous. So, they say, greetings, ma'am. How to incorporate furniture style in today's trend? So, is there a specific trend that you're picking up that's, that's quite relevant in today's time? And how do you think that this trend can be used more and more? Uh, <clears throat> I don't think there are particular... Yes, there are particular trends. In fact, we live in a we live in the twenty first century, mm -hmm. and irrespective a very contemporary house, mm -hmm. but, uh, you can have several different things in it. And I think you know when you speak about design, design is not. Um, design, you have to differentiate interior design and architecture from fashion design. Because in fashion, you have seasonal changes. Mm -hmm. uh, that is not the case in, um, in interior design. Mm -hmm. So all I can say is know all, your, know all your histories, know all your trends, and then see what you want to make of them and see how you mix things. I mean, don't become a cut and paste, I don't have a cut and paste approach because uh, that will never bring about originality of concept. Mm -hmm. oh, absolutely right. Uh, Khan Kanan uh, is asking, which would you say has been one of the most challenging projects that you've ever done? So, the most challenging, frankly, as I said earlier, was Bhutan because uh, please remember, I'm speaking of Bhutan in the 1980s. Uh, mm -hmm. Nobody knew where Bhutan was. Nobody had visited Bhutan. They didn't like to have tourists. They would only have about a limited, I think it used to be 2,500 or 3,000 Indians that they would allow in. Mm -hmm. Foreigners had such a tough time getting um, a visa to go there. And there was absolutely no, there were no books on, um, on Bhutan. Mm -hmm. So uh, my whole approach has always been to research. I mean, of course, I traveled up and down. Once I was appointed, His Majesty K4 mm -hmm. gave me a guide who was like a walking encyclopedia on Bhutanese Buddhist art. Mm -hmm. I visited many, many zongs with him across the length of Bhutan uh, um, and uh, everywhere that who I was working, I mean, they had shown a ceiling, I couldn't say it at that time, mm -hmm. uh, which is in the throne room and which is also their parliament assembly room. And the ceiling has several, had uh, what I had shown had several uh, paintings. But for that, I worked with the head lama, a head lama, who was also the director of the National School of Painting, because everything is so precise and everything has to be so exactly right. Because as you know, and I wanted, I, it was my concept that I would have the ceilings with different paintings and in the center would be a mandala. Because as you all know, a mandala, uh, uh, bestows blessings mm. those who view it or those who are below it. So I wanted that. So that means everybody who was in that uh, parliament, mm. uh, in the assembly hall would be blessed. Mm. So there are several things you work with and, and uh, it's like uh, every project is like uh, doing a PhD thesis. <laughs> And of course, then all the traveling and then all the research and I, one might use one thousandth of that research, but mm -hmm. it always has to be at, within one. Mm -hmm. Then you can make your decisions, what you will use, what you will edit out, what you will modernize, what you will contemporize. So, I mean, this is a process that goes on, I'm sure, with all designers. But, but the thing about mandala that you said, I think it was beautiful. And, and the way uh, uh, you, you almost, the person who's entering that space, the, the fact that they automatically get blessed with that mandala, I think that's a beautiful thought that you put in there uh, to, you know, make everyone feel part of something bigger. Yes. Uh, 
there's another question which talks about that what are the most important aspects to keep in mind while doing or reproducing period furniture in terms of material proportion finishes is there something that you always uh, uh, see you know uh, one of the things we talking about materiality mm -hmm. one is and now all woods are available in india you know with uh, earlier in my time we could uh, we only had access to teak wood mm -hmm. uh, finest being that came from the central provinces because even as you know all your students will know uh, that even teak wood there are 20 grades of teak wood so what wood are we speaking about it may come under the generic word of teak wood mm -hmm. but uh, you know the quality is so so very different so we used to but and then very small portions uh, uh, we could get of rosewood which is you really have to take licenses and now they become very strict and rightfully so because it is one of the endangered woods mm -hmm. uh, so then we would uh, you know for instance uh, Biedermeyer furniture uses a lot of beech wood Mm -hmm. So we would kind of uh, make the wood go blonde. There are techniques to do it, but it was not beech wood. Now, if I do it, I'm making in beech wood or I'm making in the particular wood, you know, in oak or beech or teak or whatever. One is what, what it is that you're using. And then with, uh, with again, with, uh, with mid-century furniture, Art Deco furniture in particular, and Biedermeyer furniture. And these three styles, uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, veneers had recently come in. And veneers are also industrial processes. They never existed before in early in the 19th century or 18th century. And therefore, you had no veneer work. But because they had come in and then there were very exotic veneers, you could get veneers from South America, from South Africa, etc. So the right veneering that would be used, treated in the right way, treated in the right colors. So this is the material aspect of it. Second is the proportion. Because, you know, you cannot make a ghora into a hathi or a mm -hmm. hathi into a ghora. Mm -hmm. For period furniture, there are very, very defined fine proportions which you cannot play around with because you have not designed that piece of furniture. That piece of furniture was designed in the year of Adam by either Robert Adam mm -hmm. or it was designed by Chippendale or by Sheraton. So you are not the designer. You are only reproducing it. Mm -hmm. In that fine reproduction is where uh, your skill comes in. Okay. So, you know, you spoke about how you work with multiple master craftsmen and, you know, for your projects. Uh, so the, the student asked that, how have you managed to work with the best craftsmen as well as workers for your practice all over the world? Do you personally recruit them or? Yes, uh, because for instance, uh, when I showed you the Oberoi Hotel in Bhuvaneshwar, now called the Trident, uh, this, the, this master craftsman, he had already got a Padma Shri at 26. Okay. Uh, uh, Raghunath Mahapatra. Mm -hmm. And I'm happy to say that in 2015, mm -hmm. he was the first uh, sthapati or craftsman ever to have been given the Padma Vibhushan. I mean, what a great honor that is. So when I first met him, I was in Bhubaneshwar. And of course, I traveled everywhere in Bhubaneshwar. There's not a site, I mean, in Orissa. There's not a site I have not seen. And I mean that quite literally. Mm -hmm. And um, so we had shortlisted two or three, uh, you know, master craftsmen mm -hmm. uh, in, uh, uh, who were working in stone. He only had two people working mm -hmm. with him. And in any case, I saw his work and it's so stunning that I was really very, very uh, impressed. Mm -hmm. and I had a talk with him and that was, I'm talking about... Uh, at least 45 years ago mm -hmm. okay. and uh, he had two people and then you know once his hotel was finished which the Taj magazine wrote about it the Taj writing for an Oberoi hotel mm -hmm. and called it the prettiest new hotel in India okay. the team from Japan had come and they had photographed it mm -hmm. after that and then, of course, Raghunath Mahapatra and his work, which you saw so beautifully done over there. 
so it was a very wonderful partnership because I designed everything. Mm. And he was the craftsman who built wherever the stone came. So, uh, uh, so I'm the interior architect for it. I'm the interior designer for it. Mm. And I did all the working drawings for what was going to be his stonework. Okay. That was that approach. In any case, once he got known in Japan and then he, he grew and grew and grew. And today he has 2,500 uh, uh, craftsmen whom he has trained or who work with him. Wow. In fact, when he got the Padma Vibhushan and they said, mm. uh, yeah, then I saw it. Uh, they said, what will you, what is your desire now that you've been given the first Padma Vibhushan in this category of master craftsmen. And he said, I'm going to build the second Konarak. So that is how wow. wonderful it is. So one works like that. I mean, you know, like in Bhutan, I worked with such fine painters who paint on walls. I worked with, uh, I work a lot with textiles, which I like. I work a lot with uh, bronze makers from Swami Malai, because that's, they still make their bronzes the same way as they did during the cholas. I work with glass people. I mean, they, I don't think there's a material that I have not worked with. So, and which I enjoy very much. And every time I've worked with anybody, mm -hmm. I'm enriched by it. I have learned so much. So, you know, I'm still a student also. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, our next uh question Aditi uh, says that it's always lovely listening to you and you've always been a mentor to her. Uh, she recently has just completed her course and uh, uh, for someone who's so passionate about design like you and with all your projects that you've done, uh, she says that commercialization of design is something that she's seeing in the industry and not just with the respect for design in itself. So would you have anything to say about commercialization of design? Uh, you know, uh, when, when I think maybe you can't call it commercialization of design because you can't design for yourself. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, it is a commercial activity. Design, architecture are industries. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is the business aspect mm -hmm. of design. And in fact, here they don't teach it, but say at Parsons and uh, so many other very good schools mm -hmm. of design abroad, you need to be a designer because everybody can't be a designer mm -hmm. because design is like, uh, uh, it's God given, you know, the honor, the talent has to be God given mm -hmm. like you're a musician. I mean, you might want to be a designer, but do, do all of us have it within ourselves mm -hmm. to become designers? So people who are passionate about design, there are so many other aspects. You can study the business of design. Mm -hmm. You can study design marketing, but all these uh, all these uh, courses are not available in India. I find. I mean, it's just either design or architecture. But this broad spectrum that they have in the good colleges of design abroad has yet to come in. But you know, design schools are also in their infancy, so mm -hmm. in a sense. And I'm sure that uh, in time to come. Mm -hmm. uh, all these things will inco get incorporated into the excellent institutions mm -hmm. like yours. Mm -hmm. No, of course, I think the business aspect is so important and for students to understand how to deal with it, uh, it, it it's quite important because now a lot of finances are involved. Uh, mm -hmm. You have to either make it or break it. There is more uh, stress, more pressure about it. So it's, it's important for students to be educated about it while the students tend to be, you know, pushed out in the industry and then realize it. <laughs> uh, so, yes, one of our actually uh, our student wants to know that uh, you started your career almost 50 years back. What was your first project uh, and how did you approach your first project? Because you, you also did not come from a background or had an uh, education in interior architecture. So how did you really approach your first project? Well, you know, I began off as a furniture manufacturer mm -hmm. and um, first I used to, had a, I had a small antiquarian business mm -hmm. where I get original items of furniture like Davenport desks and Regency wine tables mm -hmm. and uh, 
which was still available. 19th century furniture was still available, particularly in, in hill stations and, you know, Teradun where we have a home and Masuri where we have a home. So all of that would used to be available and you could buy it and, you know, started a little business. Then I started slowly reproducing that mm -hmm. because I always had this great uh, love for furniture. And as I told you, I studied, um, studied the history of English furniture. You know, you can teach yourself anything. Mm -hmm. You're passionate about something and you're prepared to put in the hard work. You can teach yourself anything. So, uh, and then from there I started reproducing. But in 18th and 19th, in the 18th, no, even earlier, in those centuries, uh, there was no definition of being an interior designer or a cabinet maker. It was usually cabinet makers mm. who also interior designed the salon or the room that they were working in. Uh, so in that sense, I very much belong to that old tradition of being a cabinet maker which I had become, mm -hmm. I being asked then to interior design. And as I said, my first hotel was in 1975 and with which I learned on the shop floor what it takes to design a hotel, a sort of a five-star hotel. Mm -hmm. And then fortunately for me, life went on and I've never looked back. <laughs> Darshana is asking that, uh, what is your thought process that drives your designs while reproducing any piece of furniture? I No, first I consider the space because okay. uh, I always feel whether it's a small project or a large project mm -hmm. or uh, a hotel, I mean, first you have to look at the skeleton of the space. That must be in beautiful proportion. And that must have everything in it. I always tell, I always tell my clients, I said, you know, the furniture is absolutely secondary. Mm -hmm. First you have the space in good proportion. And then what you do is you, um, uh, so that it looks beautiful on its own. Then you bring furniture. And I always tell my, when I tell my clients, look, the furniture should really be in the background. And they say, oh my God, we paid so much money and now you're saying let it be in the background. But that's the way it should be. And only if everything is, is well made and it's in good proportion, will it recede into the background and allow uh, for you know things like your artwork, your carpets, your objects that you may have collected, for all those and your own personality to shine through. So that's what I believe and that's my approach. I think I think that's so true to sort of consider everything just instead of, you know, of course, you're designing that piece, but you have to also understand the background of it, which is something that students in the initial, initial part of their journey forget to do. They're so concentrated on what they are creating that they forget where it's going to be placed. Yes, yes, I know. That's important to remember, as you said. <laughs> so this is the last question for today. Uh, but how are you anticipating the post-pandemic drawback uh, on this industry? Are you, are you anticipating the industry to have any sort of boom in certain areas? Do you think sustainable materials is something that's going to uh, come back and we're going to be taking it more and more seriously? Uh, there any, are, you, are there any sort of predictions that you have for uh, when the pandemic is over? I mean, in our, in our profession, you are speaking about. Uh, you know, I think... <clears throat> there are many lessons that uh, we've all learned from it. Mm -hmm. One is that um, that you can't fiddle around with things like climate change. Mm -hmm. you know? um, also, that we all want to live in a more sustainable world, mm -hmm. and a more simplified world. Mm -hmm. And we also... Uh, have to live with much more compassion. Of course, there are compassion because you've seen the terrible tragedies that have happened with uh, migrant workers. Yes. So we cannot live our privileged lives without, uh, without uh, being totally conscious of 
-hmm. what happens to 60% of our population. Mm -hmm. So I think um, in that sense, design is not the most important thing, mm -hmm. but of course, uh, architecture and design is going to carry on and as it should very much carry on. But I think there are going to be, you know, like I know in new homes that Kohelika is designing. I mean, there are, there are, there are clean air systems that are being put in, but why not have clean air that you don't have to put in the system? And, uh, you know, I mean, it's a simple thing because these are all very expensive things. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, I think we're all going to be more sentient about the fact that, um, that uh, monies must be well spent mm -hmm. and where they need to go into the right sort of areas. Uh, one thing that, you know, ours is my furniture business, completely a handmade, uh, mm -hmm. you know, it's completely in a handmade sector. Uh, so I think there is, and that just goes to show that we, I mean, after all, I also export, my furniture has gone to almost uh, four or five uh, continents mm -hmm. and where it's hugely appreciated because, you know, it's all made by hand. And I think you'll see much more of this happening, that what we make is of such excellent quality mm -hmm. that you don't have to uh, get machine-made furniture, say from Italy, which looks like handmade. Mm -hmm. One have the handmade stuff in itself. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, fewer and fewer people are going to uh, uh, are, are going to kind of uh, uh, I mean or rather I, I'll put it the other way around more and more people are going to look at what can be uh, made in the country of course there are even say in lighting etc great lighting is not being manufactured in our country mm -hmm. But I think this may change. So in many of the, of the interiors I showed you, all the lights are by very famous designers. Mm -hmm. and, you know, either it's uh, they're Italian or they're from Canada or they're Danish mm -hmm. because we're not making that quality of light. But maybe that will also change, you know, because I think we can make anything uh, in our country. And I think more and more people are, so whether it's across textiles, it's across lights, it's across uh, uh, systems, I mean, I think much more technology also will be developed. I mean, if you have, for instance, retractable uh, ceilings, uh, which evidently we are importing, mm. but people will start making uh, retractable ceilings, which you can get from here. Or for instance, I think the best doors and windows is made by a firm called Artius. Mm -hmm. And uh, they compare with the best in the world. Mm -hmm. And now they have brought in this huge technology of making wooden structures, wooden homes. And in fact, they took 15, I think, architects uh, to Canada for this world, uh, world exhibition of uh, structures, which are five feet, six feet, 12, I mean, uh, stories high, mm -hmm. all made out of wood. Because that is a sustainable material. So I think sustainability will, uh, and being handmade at the same time uh, will have a much greater future in design. I think, I think that, that is absolutely right. I think we're also heading towards it as an institution. We're also becoming more and more ethical in our practices to avoid global warming. Like you said, why put an instrument to purify air than just to do our bit to get that air purified? naturally so i think that's a very very important perspective that we should we should think about uh, that yeah. design is in its place and we have to make it better and better for humanity but let's do a bit instead exactly exactly and i think india is poised in that wonderful position mm -hmm. uh, because of our because of our skills which have been with us for centuries uh, because of our inventiveness which is integral to us Mm -hmm. And if, I mean, even when you think of a word like jugar, after what is jugar? It's being inventive, you know, yeah. you've mm -hmm. got around the problem, but you managed to get around it. But in, a, you know, and then we have such diversity, we have such craftsmanship in our country. 
I think all these need to be nurtured. Like the Japanese will have a couple of craftsmen and they call them national treasures. We've got national treasures right now in the millions. So let us not destroy them. We must look after them and we must respect them. That is what I think. Well, that's true. As designers, I think it is our responsibility to, to sort of, you know, like you said, you, you did su such good collaborative work with these craftsmen. Yes. And then, you know, you help them understand what they can do as well in a way while they taught you something about their craft. Yeah, I also learned so much from them. I mean, every time I interact with a craftsman, I learn so much more. And you see, the thing is that, uh, as Kohilka was saying in another webinar, and I was hearing her, which was a week ago, she was saying that what gives an architect the arrogance mm -hmm. or a site supervisor the arrogance to think that they can make that curved wall in brick and they know more than that Raj Mistri. <laughs> the Raj Mistri knows more no? because he's got the experience. He's yeah. been doing it all his life. Mm -hmm. So an architect can make the drawing mm -hmm. but the supervisor can't be supervising the Raj Mistri. Mm -hmm. No, it is the Raj Mistri who will say that this is what you should do. And this is what you should do. And this is what you should do. And this is what you So there's much to be learned. And I think we, this, this kind of uh, formal, informal give and take of mm -hmm. knowledge uh, has to be made much more two way than possible. Absolutely, I think uh, I think that that's that's what we need in the future as well. Uh, yes. to have more collaboration with with craftsmen at a daily level. I think each yes. student should somehow try and adopt a craftsman and you know learn from them, help them build a business as well. Yes. Uh, but thank you so much uh, for coming in and thank for talking to our students. <laughs> no, thank you so much. It's always a pleasure to be with JD, with the JD Institute. I'm not new to it. And thank you for asking me. I feel deeply honored. I think all the honor is all ours for you to come in and share such elaborate work that you've done. I know the students have learned a lot. I know the students will have more and more questions. And we really hope to see you at our campus once everything is safe and sound. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much, Akshara. And thank you, the rest of your team. So I know everyone had an amazing uh, session. I think uh, the best thing about the webinar was that it was quite visual. And uh, that is all thanks to Sunita Ji for bringing all her work, combining and showing it to all of you about how uh, the mid-century furniture work, what is important while, while producing furniture. And also her long list of work, which included a lot of restoration projects and how to imbibe our own traditional cultural heritage into each piece or each space that we plan. Uh, I know a lot of students work on similar lines for their fashion awards project and we hope that you got a lot more insight about how to take your projects and your concepts further uh, for the fashion awards that we soon hope to host. Uh, uh, don't forget to come back again tomorrow at five o'clock. We would be talking about biomimicry and its uh, uh, and its newfound place in design, not newfound, but uh, how biomimicry has become more and more accepted uh, within the Indian domain as well now. Uh, so yes, and if you have more questions, please feel free to let your faculties know and we will try and get more answers regarding those questions. Bye everyone.